Folks, it is time to invest in your game night. Buy it or don't, the party game is live on Kickstarter now. You and your friends craft hilariously terrible one-of-a-kind products by combining a descriptor, a noun, and slogan cards. And then you got to convince the other players to buy. Like, okay, for example, what do I have here? Um, Okay, Uh, gothic is my descriptor. Oh, boy. Uh, Man-eating chicken uh, is my noun. And you'll never be alone again is the slogan. Okay, let's give this a shot. Uh, Swain, you know how you live in uh, Dracula's castle and it's full of all the taxidermied animals and skeletons that you love so much? Well, look, not all of us have the luxury of being able to stock up on, on skeletons to keep us company. So tonight I'm announcing my new product. Yes, it is a little bit creepy, but you can take your KFC bucket and you can turn it into... Find statues to adorn your house in a classic gothic sensibility with my product, Bones, I, I don't know. But this the slogan is you'll never be <laughs> alone again. We'll, we'll work on it. It's a fun thing. It's a fun thing. Buy it or don't is a total pitch fest. Buy it or don't, the party game is live on Kickstarter today. Go buy it now. You know, Swain, I, I realized something today, you know, feeling a little sad. Yeah. Uh, I get those vibes, man. It's been a... Yeah. It's been a very retrospective few weeks. Yeah, and the, the thing that's just in the back of my head this whole time, you know, we're not going to be giving people tips anymore, uh, you know, week after week for the rest of Destiny's life, but... Yeah, that, that would make me sad. And the thing is, I can't give anyone advice when fallen become a playable class in destiny oh man a thing i am convinced is going to happen and i know it will probably in destiny 3 oh they're gonna probably have so many cool abilities for arms for melee animations for guns who knows what kind of supers they can pull off yeah and like four guns will be really good in the destiny battle royale playlist duh and yeah, right. The dual wielding or quad quad wielding, it's going to be out of control. And I've all but convinced myself this is definitely going to happen. It's something I believe yeah. firmly. And I just feel bad we well, can't do a podcast about it. Well, what about this? What about this? Mm-hmm. Make a pact. Okay. Make a pact. I'm listening. When, when it happens, we start a whole new podcast. Me and you. Okay. No birds. <laughs> Screw that guy. Fallen radio. Okay, it's going to happen. And when I say it's going to happen, I mean it's really going to happen because Fallen will be a playable class in Destiny someday. I know this for a fact. I'm sure of it. And virtual handshake. (laughs) Yep. I shook my hand in the air for some reason like an idiot. Anyways, on with the show. (laughs) Welcome to Crucible Radio. This is going to be a real weird intro bit so that like, you know, down the line when we're like, all right, we're done talking about Destiny. But someone comes along and it's like, oh, I heard you guys did Destiny advice. Where can I listen? I would be like, oh, listen to these two episodes. And then they listen to that intro right. bit and they're like, Psh, these guys predicted the future. <laughs> well, it's actually kind of my specialty in the Destiny world. If I've contributed anything to this community, it's weirdly mm. predicting the plot of Destiny 2 in <laughs> fan fiction. So you're the you're the weird psychic that's like <laughs> on the side of the road out front smoking, chain smoking cigarettes, yeah. trying to get people to come in. Be like, oh, you want to know about Destiny? 3? Yeah, you want to know the plot about a video game? The most useless, like supernatural power. That's me. That's Bones. Go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is Madam Bones. <laughs> Madam Bones, <laughs> new character. I'll develop that. Uh, this is this is part two of Crucible Radio's ultimate guide to getting good 
Uh, it's a, a culmination of everything that we learned and everything that we've been taught from our beloved guests and friends that have come on the show. And last week in part one, we talked about the mental game because I think we found out somewhere early on in this show is that nothing was going to work. Nothing was going to improve if we weren't in the right headspace. And it's become a key component of this show over 200 episodes. And uh, so many clips from the episodes we pulled from were just just incredible. And it's, yeah. re- it's really crazy that we we just approached it like, hey, let's learn the metal. Let's talk about good roles. Like, what's the best gun? And suddenly we found ourselves discussing you know, like our mental health in such a way and, and how to really be competitive. Put yourself in an environment, find that flow state, like really going above and beyond. And I think all those things had some of the biggest impact on our improvement. Yeah. And it's also one of the reasons we were able to do this many episodes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Simply because we were like, all right. There's nothing new in Destiny. What can we talk about that takes it to like the next level? Yeah. And then, like looking inward at what we've come so far. Is sometimes that mental stuff that doesn't happen on purpose. Like right. that is just over and over again doing something slightly different and like naturally finding your way towards being better and getting good. And Oh, you look back on it and you're like, wow, I used to think that way. I was <laughs> the worst. Such why a scrub. Did I, yeah, why was I like that? But, you know, if you are looking for something a little bit more technical, uh, this is the episode for you. Yeah, yeah, th- that's it goes hand in hand. There's so many things you can focus on when there's not new content, when you're not just picking up a new gun and trying to get a hang of it, when you didn't just get your God roll, dust rock or whatever. You can always be improving, but those fundamentals and the mechanics really come into play. And those are the things you're going to apply and practice. You know, you've spent the time reviewing the tape. You've been in the meetings, right? But you got to get on the field and go out and do stuff and actually practice and all those mechanics become very important. And these can apply to lots of shooters, any sort of competitive sort of approach. Uh, but of course we've specified and we've, uh, you know, specialized on, on crucible for this long. So we have some direct tips on how you can get better for today. And today we're going to frame this around an episode we did All the way back in, well, what month was it? May of 2017? Uh, Yes, this was three weeks after the Destiny 2 premiere. And it was suddenly like, oh my God. But uh, (laughs) right around the time where Destiny 2 got announced, we're like, well, what are we going to do? We got to tell these people about the meta in D1. Let's go back to basics. So we did that for a few episodes. And in episode 103, we covered the tiers of players. And it's framed very easily in the sort of metal system that games like Overwatch use. You know, you got bronze, silver, gold. And uh, we used that to discuss where a player might be if they fall on those ranks and what they should be working on. And this is not to say you can't work on everything or that you can't actually look at a grandmaster and gain something from their play and, you know, take something back and apply it to yours and improve. But it's really helpful to know where you might fall and what real, uh, real things you can focus on. And that was a really good episode. I might, I might say it ends up being like the water line. Like you may not always perform at the level that you're at, but you always kind of tend to return to that level Mm -hmm. at some point. And sometimes you go a little bit further up and you inch your way. It's never really like a big surge up to the bigger ranks. Right. Especially at first, like you can think of it as like filling, filling a pool almost like you start off in the like rank to get up, a rank from bronze, silver to gold. It's like easier, easier, easier. Well, easy, easy, a little bit harder, a little bit harder. And then like, as you go to get, fill it up, it takes a lot of effort. Yeah. And, and each of these ranks applies different uh, things from, you know, like episode one, all that mental game, like that plays (laughs) into this, you know, you can have really, really fast reaction time. Maybe you come from, uh, I don't know, Call of Duty or CSGO or something like that. Your your accuracy is perfect, but you don't look at Destiny in the same way and apply you know your knowledge to new game modes and things like that. Or maybe your teamwork is not that strong. No one wants to admit it, but it's true. So let's just really quickly hit on all of these ranks and sort of like the main 
uh, elements of players in those ranks. And that'll sort of like structure this, this whole episode. We'll pull some clips and maybe birds will show up by the time we're done doing this. <laughs> Before we start, do you think you've gone up a level since that conversation? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I think, I think, uh, where do you think you are now? You know, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six ranks and the top being master, which I know I'm not, I think I play at a diamond level uh, a lot of the time. I think my, my game improved so much on my mission to Claymore, uh, and, and playing, you know, with cap and, you know, y'all, y'all have heard from him at this point, but I mean, imagine that in my ear while I'm, you know, in game and stuff like that, like my awareness got better. I sort of better understood who I was as a player, my role in the game and definitely my shot just drastically improved. But from the time I switched to mouse and keyboard and was figuring that out to right now, like I played some last night and I was like, man, this is like a battle against some four stacks, but I am hitting some shots. Like my accuracy is, is pretty good. And maybe even a little apex has helped that too. But yeah, I definitely feel like I'm, I'm pushing myself and, you know, I take a couple of weeks off and I'm back down to the gold platinum sort of attitude, or maybe I'm just playing casually or tired. But when I want the recluse and when I got that, finally, it was like, yeah, okay. I, I know I'm, I know I'm up there. I know I'm getting good at this game and, and have, have done a lot. What about you? Um, man, I feel like I, I'm close to platinum. I feel it feels that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Thinking about how gold is uh, a lot, like pretty much everything in gold I can do. Um, And there's parts of platinum that I feel pretty confident about. Um, And I I would say I'm like slowly, I'm breaking, I'm like low platinum. Yeah. (laughs) Well, and I think, you know, this is something we talked about a hundred episodes ago or something like that. But you know, I've, we've been playing together since we started this show. And I remember throughout D one, just, I don't know, from the first time we played together till the end when we were just running trials and going flawless, like your, your improvement was the most drastic I've ever seen, you know? And, and that's like a testament to your (laughs) application of these things, right? You're not just listening to a guest or just repeating, stuff on the show each week, like you were getting in there playing and displaying it, right? Like applying all of those things. And it was really crazy. It's, like you, you, you just jumped up levels and levels <laughs> and levels week after week. It's not like, it's one of those things that I have to kind of rely on the heavy mental side mm-hmm. more because my like, uh, thumb skill isn't always <laughs> we, the best. We are like half a decade, if not more past prime gamer age <laughs> like there is <laughs> oh a reality to that that we don't even it doesn't even have to feel old it's just that uh yeah the youth that uh <laughs> that has those skills in that reaction time same same for me even if i do uh have a good shot at this point it's crazy yeah and like <clears throat> i've kind of i would say i've i've definitely plateaued myself like, yeah i know this happens i know where i'm at and i'm not mad about it right Right. And we, um, we talked about, I think even when we discussed this uh, originally is just like, look, this skill ceiling is up there and you don't have to be bumping your head against it. And most players, 99% of players aren't bumping their heads against the skill ceiling. And that sort of helps you get a better picture of what you, you know, maybe criticize the game for and things like that, where it's like, (laughs) you know what, like I've got a lot of thoughts on how the game could change, but I'm nowhere near to mastering it. That's an absurd notion. Very few people are. Yeah. It's a, for me, I'm like, all right, I'm I'm where I'm at and it helps me enjoy every single game I play, no matter what it is. For sure. I can pick it up and I know if I can just get some small mechanics down quick and like it may just be mapping certain buttons to a controller. Right. And I feel so much more confident in that game because of all the years of destiny. Like it's very evident in like a game like apex. Like I didn't need to know much to know how to operate in that game or something like overwatch. I'm just like, okay, I know how this kind of works and I have the skill sets that I've learned and I can just throw them right on top. 
Yeah, and you you have the fundamentals and the the those base skills that you've built into yourself now, so you can immediately apply them to a new game, and you're not going to look like what the fuck? I, why did I die? What is this going on? Like you're you're already past all those steps, but you also have realistic expectations for yourself, and that's important for everyone, no matter the skill. Like, don't log on <laughs> to Overwatch for the first time and be like, God damn it, why am I not top five hundred? It's like, well, because sure. <laughs> you're not like that in any stage of your competitive life, you know, like the realism. There's a, like, like pro athletes, it's very similar with like people that play video games. There's very, very few people <laughs> that show up and have that uncanny, like natural ability to just own in every single video game, like yeah. show up and just be like, okay, I'm one of the best already. Like, I don't even have to know much. I just uh, can learn on the fly um, I can apply things very fast and kind of just like learn the meta quick. Mm-hmm. Like that's always the biggest thing is like what's being used all the time, like the most and how can I like break it to be even better? Well, and we'll find out soon that the, uh, you know, fast decision making is one of the most important parts. And if you can just do that quickly, you will immediately start to succeed. But let's, let's go through these real quick and then we'll dive deeper into each of the, uh, mechanics discussed or, or, or where that really comes into play exclusively to destiny and things like that. Okay. For sure. Bronze bottom tier, not at like, not everyone starts there, but it's the starting plat platform when you learn, right? Like that's this, we're talking, can you press the buttons at the same time, right? Like, are you turning and aiming at the same time? Have you mastered controlling two different <laughs> sticks on your controller? This, uh, uh, have you properly Kelly, mapped things to your, con- to your is controller? Not in Brahms. Hey, that's fair. Not everyone is, but if you're going to play destiny, mm-hmm. like that's where you start. And, uh, you know, this is just learning basic stuff and you pick up these things. The more you play, uh, it doesn't take a lot of like, intense self-reflection to get out of this. Uh, but just learning the rules of the game, sensible loadouts, fundamentals of target acquisition, you know, how far away should I be if I'm holding a hand cannon? How far away should I be with a pulse rifle? That comes from uh, game time and just experience with the game, but a little critical thinking. Yeah. And then silver, you've got your movement skills. You're traveling with authority and thought. Now you're not sort of blindly wondering what's going to happen or who's going to show up in front of you. Uh, you've got the wherewithal to maybe run away or reposition, right? Even just knowing like that <laughs> there's two options, right? Like, like it's not just die not hold forward. Here. Right. We talk about holding forward all the time. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then your aim is starting to get consistent. You know, you're hitting, you're hitting your shots. Uh, at gold, this is where a majority of players in, a, in an entire population lie. You know, it's just the middle. So it's where the most people are going to be. And that is good because it means you've got a pretty good grasp on the game. You know, most people play at this level, that 1.0 to 1.1 to 1.2, you know, winning slightly more than 50% of your engagements. But you've got your eye level and your tracking down. You probably know the meta to some extent. Uh, You have general game awareness, you know, like what mode are you playing? What are your enemies probably doing? And you understand the maps, like where the rat lanes are and where spawns are happening. So you're not just, again, completely lost. You're starting to predict things correctly now. And then we have platinum. Platinum is, like I said, that's where I feel I fit the best Mm -hmm. at the moment. And that's uh, like manipulating enemies, exposing weaknesses, having fast decision, fast OODA loops. Let's just say that. (laughs) Fast decision making process. The OODAs. Uh, Precision accuracy, consistent effective call-outs during gameplay, and high-level mechanics. Yeah, and, and specific to Destiny, I mean, these are the things where you start getting a feel for stuff like the shotgun-melee combo. If you watch any really skilled streamer, they melee nothing a lot, and you wonder why they do that, and then you realize that's an instinct to follow up, because if your shotgun even misses a little bit, you finish with that melee faster than your opponent can do anything. Those are the sort of combos you're going to start applying to really start beating out your enemies and actually outsmarting them, you know, play by play. And then after that diamond, this is a high level gameplay, right? This really does encompass a pretty wide 
uh, um, amount of players because there, this is where we get into stuff like you, maybe your raw skill carries you high enough to be in diamond. Like you just have such accuracy with a mouse that I can't understand how you snipe in this game. So well, like that kind of thing. Uh, or maybe you're more like me and your shots pretty good. You know, you don't miss that often, but you on you look at the game like I do, which is just like, I gotta, I gotta know everything that's going on and I gotta predict what they're doing. And I gotta know what's really likely to happen when this enemy comes around a corner and assume that they know a lot about this game too. You know, like that's how I hang there. Uh, and then you get the player roles, which is really exciting. And, uh, you know, cap really went into detail with this. I believe you'll be hearing from him today. Stuff like Mm -hmm. becoming a shot caller on your team and actually learning communication and good communication, not just like screaming into the microphone, but you're simultaneously talking out what you're doing and, uh, you know, being effective uh, as a teammate. That is what bumps people up into this level. Can you be a good teammate or do you just go pub stomp? And last but not least, there's the master level. And master big asterisk on this one, as I already said, you know, you can take things from this watch players who qualify as a master of a game and learn from that and apply it to your game for sure. But people at this level are looking at the game a little bit differently. They've already got an encyclopedic knowledge of what's happening, of the game, of the meta, of every weapon they might see, what's good, what's bad. But they also know the big picture stuff. And there's this really cool way to look at the two things called strategy and tactics. Strategy is big picture stuff, calling a big play or knowing what your team might be thinking. Tactics is your actual decisions during the engagements, the OODA loops, the decision to jump or to slide and just knowing it's going to be right, that sort of thing. And, And to improve at this level and to compete at this level, you have to be pushing your game just 1% better. You know, like that's how you win. It's that 1% because your opponent is going to be just as good as you. The only way to beat them is to be just, just better. Uh, You know, finding new ways to use the game and the tools given, you know, that's, this is where people start actually setting trends, you know, like they, cause they found a way to be good and to use something that no one else was doing. So, so that's, that's important. That's where the skills for everyone else down in platinum and and gold need to start picking up, right? You watch a good player Mm -hmm. do that. Everyone gets the feel for that. That's how you learn. So lots, lots to take away from all of these levels. Yeah. I really have thought a lot about the different things and the different levels over this past year or so. Um, and how much, I strive for the next thing. And, you know, like you said, you don't always have to be like, uh, staying in your lane, staying in your level. You can like look up right. and see the other things. And that's definitely when I'm watching someone like on Twitch or something, I'm definitely like, Oh my God, they're doing something that I don't even think <laughs> about. Like yeah. I'm not even there yet. So, um, it's always nice to see someone else do it fail miserably to do it myself in a video game and then be like, Oh yeah, that's, that's definitely hard. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk some fundamentals. Shall we? Let's do it. Wait, hold on a minute. Birds. Birds. Is that you? Hey, Hey, Hey man. Hey man. Whoa. Where, where have you been? So, well, okay. There's a lot of crucible radio episodes. I've been listening to a lot of crucible radio episodes. And here's the thing about the man there's, we've done like almost 200 episodes and you kind of have to listen to all of them to see what the good parts are, but you actually have to listen to them. You have to get through all of them. So what I found is that if you turn up the speed on it, you can get up to two X, you get up to three X actually, before you start to can't really, you can't really understand before. It's a very efficient way to digest the show. Uh, I realized that as I listen back to this, that it's going to be too fast because I'm already talking too fast. But uh, what I hear right now when I listen to the show regular and I listen to you guys talk is that you guys sound drunk. Oh my God. You're just like, no, no, no. You're in two times speed right now. I think you've been in (sighs) super fast podcast mode for so long that you now think that's normally how voices sound, but you're talking incredibly fast. Okay. Well, I, or that's too slow. That's too many breaks between words. You know how this works. We're 200 episodes deep. You're great at this. Come on. I, 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 I'll get into it. Do you have a question for me? What are you guys talking about? Yeah, well, we were sort of talking about, you know, all of these ranks and player skill levels and sort of where we felt we were on these ranks, especially after so many years of doing the show. 
What about you? How do you fall on this whole scale? Oh, man. Okay, well, I've been listening to all these episodes, and there's stuff that I'm listening back to at every single level where I go, oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> I, should, I do that more. Yeah. I would say, you know, if I'm if I'm out of practice or I'm not in the zone, I'm bronze. I've got to, I've really got to start there. And then I work my way back up, and I start to get in the flow, and I start being able to put other things on autopilot and get back into it. But I think I probably top out at platinum in this game. Mm -hmm. I think I maybe have had a moment or two at Diamond where I was really thinking about not just myself, but the whole team. But I think for me, being able to really increase my processing speed and slow it down when needed, uh, getting solid on my mechanics, making good, strong, basic callouts, I think that's really the the challenge for me right now. Also, I solo queue a lot. So, you know, you, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you'll top out at platinum at best if yep. you don't play with people. Yep, yep. Well, that's good. It's, it's good to know where you're at. It's how you improve. And that's the point of this episode. Yeah. Hey, hopefully if you see me out there, you catch me on a platinum day. Well, uh, now that you've dug through every episode, which you've listened to somehow in the last uh, 48 hours since we were planning this. Yeah, man. What, uh, what do you want to start with? Well, we got to start at the beginning. Uh, and you know, this... This is bronze, right? This is the bare minimum of just learning how to play the game. Um, And actually, the people we've had on are generally pretty good players, and we take a lot of this stuff for granted. But there was a few kind of ideas that really jumped out for me. Um, And also, I knew that I wanted to hear from some of our friends. So uh, if there was anything we knew him for, it is loadouts. This very first clip is from episode 119. This is our good buddy Fallout Plays. Well, so we've sort of been talking about, you know, about streamers, about heroes, about really great players who are out there figuring out new angles. Um, but I have, um, I don't know if this qualifies as one, but I want to hear the drop again. Andrew, I got a hot take. Hey, yo, CR, can you throw me a hot take? Hot take! I love it. I think that Destiny 2 is at a magical, magical time right now because we have only the most obvious, quote unquote, meta going right now. And that there are so many play styles that could become the dominant meta that no one really knows. No one has the complete story for where it's going to go, where we're going to end up. And the hot take part of it is, is that if you're just sitting around playing with your trials loadout 24-7 or only playing with guns that streamers play with, you are doing yourself a disservice. Anybody can figure out a new play style, can find that next sleeper gun, can, can put together a good enough montage showing off an unusual play style and change the game. And if all you're rocking is Mighty Uriels, you are missing out. It's so much fun. I just like I I just made a resolution. I'm not going to put a gun permanently in my vault or dismantle it until I've played PVP with it. And that is tough. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's possible. I so so thinking about grenade launchers, I I did it the other night. I said, "All right, let's get them all." I, I save one of everything. I pull them all out of my vault. First things first, just take them into PVE and I just want to play with them. I just want to yeah. you know Shoot dregs in the EDZ, like see how they bounce this whole like hold and release to detonate thing. Figure that thing out. How fast do they go? Some of them sticked and some of them, some of them are switchable, but just kind of get a handle on what I like, sort of what seems to fit me and then take it into PVP and try and prove it out. Play a whole quick play game where I'm just gunning for power ammo the whole time so I can practice my grenade shots on people and just figure out what works. Do I try and go for the bounce shot around a corner or do I get up into the air? So I'm shooting down like a, a, a cut rate rocket that I don't have to reload every time and just playing with it. And I don't like, I'm no crucible scientist, but I find pretty quickly what works for me and what doesn't. I did the same thing with pulse rifles where I went through every single pulse rifle I had, just like swapping them in and out with dim. And I just shot a wall in the EDZ looking at recoil patterns and trying to figure out what works, switching the perks around, switching the scopes around. And it's not really a numbers thing. It's just what feels good. Like, oh, this is grouped nice and tight, but it just, I don't like the zoom on it anymore. And, and it takes too long to scope in and just come up with instant preference. You know, birds, it, it makes me really happy 
to hear you say that all those things makes me really happy because Aww. not enough people just like to, you know, get their hands in the dough. It, it just figure it out. I mean, it, there's, there's such a joy though, yeah. about the, about the way people look at it though, is a lot of people just like go into the destiny database and look at guns all day when they're at work and say like, here's this Nothing archetype. Wrong with that. Guilty. Which, Great yeah, place no, to start. of course. Guilty. But like people just look at the archetypes they're like, Oh, Especially when like a new event drops, like these faction wars, they're like, oh, look at all these crappy guns. And it's like, okay, well, a lot of times archetypes are telling of what works and what doesn't work. Sure. But your people aren't going in and like using them. And a lot of people aren't even looking at perks, like perk combinations. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how I stumbled across like the rampage stuff because it was like, I didn't even know it was a perk. And when I started using it, I was like, oh my God, this is awesome like why wouldn't i like try and get things with this perk on it and there are certain guns that like come out and they're like they're not the best but they have a niche 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 a, niche. Niche. niche yes oh okay night nice yeah. nice it's got a nice it's, it's a nice yeah. yeah it's nice <laughs> it's very nice anyway nice. <laughs> it's got nice. its own little play style to it and i may have never discovered it Unless I gave it a gave it a whirl. Exactly. And there's a lot of guns out there that you can really have a good time with. And I mean, not just going into PvP and having fun or goofing around. You can ruin people with these guns. I mean, like, there's that gun out there, the SMG, that I still don't have. Bungie, if you're listening, can you please take the dial on my streamer RNG benefit? Can you just turn that up to like 11 for like just a day? Please a day. It's the, the, day, the, the yeah. Antiope. Or I think it's it's the Antiope. Yeah, I would do. I mean, I'm not, like <laughs> is, I don't is know that that's a, a fact, but I've been corrected on. I was just gonna say the only person time. who has told me that it was Antiope was Bones, but I was gonna say he's not here. I can call it whatever I want. But yeah, I think nah. I, I, I think I told Bones it was pronounced Antiope. So if that's Got wrong, it. you can trace it back to me and blame me. But I'm like 90 <laughs> percent sure it's Antiope. Fair. Continue. Yes, that's a really good SMG. I've seen a lot of people crush with it. I still don't have one, but I got a blue when leveling up my Titan. And I know a lot of uh -huh. people would have just yeah, taken like the Philippus or something. Something I can't even remember what it's called, but I was just looking at it and I was like, wait a minute. That's the same archetype as the Antiope. And uh, nice. I think a lot of people would just throw the blue into the trash can. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to try this. And I went into PVP and I just smoked people and uh, they, they had no idea that it's coming. I mean, cause you don't think that a blue could do as well on paper as a legendary, but it's, it's almost the same thing. I mean, the recoil pattern, yeah, the recoil pattern's a little different, but it puts in work. You just have to go in there and do a little experimenting. You can find stuff that, that really ruins people. I like, uh, it's its own little secret when you kill someone with, uh, something they don't know. Yes. It, they kind of, it's depending on the person. And obviously some people are a little bit more level headed than the others. But if you kill someone with a gun that they're not familiar with, you could tilt someone. Like Yeah. Oh yeah. To the point where like it's it's tried and true. People send messages about guns being OP and simply because they've never heard of it. They're like or they're just mad that they got killed by something they don't know of or they don't have. <laughs> it's it's almost uh, it's almost guaranteed. There's lots of good Fallout clips out there. He's been on a lot. We love him. But that's a perfect one to, to start off with. Yeah, this next one is from one of the best to ever play the game. And it starts out from a good point, which is to say you got to find people to play with. Build up strength with others at your same skill level. Develop camaraderie and you'll be stronger together. It works. This is Luminosity from episode 31. At the end of the week, we usually have 100 or 200 requests to join. And, like, we just, like, tell them, like, people are like, hey, how can I join? But at the moment, you know, it's just, like, we started off as friends. You know what I mean? Like, when we mm -hmm. picked the clan, yeah, we were good players. But we have some people in there who, like, have, like, a point eight KD. But they're really good friends. You know what I mean? And I tell people, like, the point of a clan has always been you make it with friends. You know what I mean? People who will make the game more enjoyable. And that is what we are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it can be tough, too, because if you're trying to really push yourself and you want to surround yourself with good players, sometimes mm -hmm. the first instinct is to just say, like, 
well, let's just join a group or something like yeah. that. But I find like it's much more enjoyable to go through the process of getting yeah, better. The journey. If you're playing with your friends, yeah. you know, if, as opposed to just going up against someone who, who's going to stomp you and not care about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting uh, dynamic there. Yeah, we get like, you know, people are like, hey, you want to play us or whatever. And, you know, I want to play everyone, but you're not going to get better if we go in and you get two kills and we just like end the game, you know, a minute into it. Like, you don't get better. Uh -huh. um, like, you know, one team in the tourney that we played, um, you know, props to them. You know, they made it. They made it past pre-qualifiers, but we played them and it took like an hour and a half to match up first game. You know, we had to let, you know, we had to let them kill us so we wouldn't, you know, apple them and have to re-Q. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, as I tell people, like, you know, play against people your skill level and then get, you know, as you keep getting better, then play people better than you. You can't jump in with the top players and expect to do well because just like playing pubs and like competitive, it is, you know, I know people are like Destiny doesn't have competitive, but when you play those players, you're blown away. Like just whatever they do, whatever it is, whatever their gun skill is, you can't compete if you've never played people of that skill level. Right. So you made the shift from being you know, a top 10 player and being very solid, but really kind of rolling solo. And then you're in a team situation all of a yeah. sudden with other good players. Did you sort of see changes in your gameplay or sort of learning from that aside from just the sort of basic of being a good solo 1v1 player? I mean, coming from COD, like I had good, you know, like uh, reaction speed, whatever. You know, my gun skill is good. But one of my clan members at the time was like easily the best player I played against or played with. And I learned, like he stopped playing long ago, but I credit him for a lot of where I am today. He made, because I made a Titan, he made Golden Gun. But when I switched over to Hunter... Like, I learned everything, like, trip mine spots, when to pop golden gun, you know, like, what shotgun to use, what sniper to use. It's like, I'm glad I joined, because Destiny wasn't as, like, straightforward as I thought, because I wasn't into PvE. I didn't do VOG for a month and a half. <laughs> and then it wasn't until I started getting killed by found verdicts, I would start raging, like, oh. I, you know, I'd have a green shock, and I'm like, ah, oh. and then he took me through it. I remember he took me through hard, and then, you know, he made me a better player. You know, you definitely need to play with other people, and, they'll, you know, they will teach you stuff. I play Hunter Shade Step, right? But whenever I play a Warlock, I don't do that great if I go into a competitive game. So I watch other people play it, and I learn what they do, and I try to mimic that. Mm -hmm. Just go on Bungie, find a clan, you know, or go on Twitch, you know, try and, you know, sub to someone, join a sub clan, and there are good people, and you will become a better player. Yeah, I in my experience, it was the hardest step for sure was just... We're just taking that first step of saying like I'm gonna play with anybody mm -hmm. and I'm gonna I'm gonna join any clan and as soon as you sort of get the ball rolling you meet people you meet friends of friends and mm -hmm. you sort of build your network and and then you have so many more choices but it's just you just have to take that first step to really to really get it mm -hmm. going yeah I think one of the hardest parts about this process has been just trying to pick the clip from our friend that best kind of sums it up. I had a lot of trouble picking one for Holtzman. Holtzman's been been hanging out with us since the beginning. And this one I thought really just hit it for me because he touches on a couple important things. He touches on a very fundamental lesson, but this was also the very first time we, we talked with him. And I remember thinking at the time, man, this guy gets it. He's all right. This is uh, Holtzman from episode 30. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, let's say, uh, get good advice for our listeners? Like something real quick, what they, what they can do to get better. The best thing you can honestly do is if, if you find yourself blaming other things, is ask just ask yourself what did I do wrong not what what happened there from the you know the perspective of the other person keep keep it focused on yourself what could you have done differently in that situation when you died uh review your footage so you'll start note or like start recording some of your footage if you have Xbox one you know PS4 record some footage and just see what's see what you did wrong in that engagement where could you have taken a different route entirely to get to that place? Uh, should you have been, you know, noticing some different sight lines, uh, never, never blame the other player, uh, Preach, for brother. defeating you. <laughs> yeah. Here, here. Yep. Inward. Got to look inward. All right. We're moving on to silver. We've got the basics down. It's time to really get cracking and start grinding and learn some skills. This one from our good friend, Keen Koala from episode 69 is one of the most helpful skills you'll ever know in this game. Well, what kind well, of secrets do you want to know? 
Well, you uh, you have a knack for boiling down uh, some pretty uh, important ideas into very memorable mantra length uh, sentences. And there's one of them that's been stuck in the back of my head for weeks. Whenever I feel like I'm not playing right, I just say to myself, push into cover. I've, I've unpacked this thing every which way. You've, you've shown how it works in so many different ways. Uh, wise one, share with us, what does it mean to push into cover? Uh, okay, so pushing into cover basically has, has two forms to it. There's a push in and a push out of cover. And it's mainly how you're going to move around a map and then engage your opponents. So when you move around a map, generally you don't want to hold sprint and run straight at someone, right? Because what? you don't necessarily know where they're going to be at. You have to be reading your radar at the same time as well as checking where they're at. So if you end up in the middle of a lane with no cover around you, you're just going to get shot at, right? So this idea of pushing into cover and pushing out of cover is a way to move around the map safely. So it gives you time to check your surroundings and to check your radar uh, safely because you're going to be be behind a box or you know above uh, a lane things like that so when you push into cover it mainly requires you to jump and slide a lot um, as well as sprint but mostly you want to stay off radar and move quickly uh, and so and the way maps are set up you basically get to zigzag on them a lot if you move in and out of cover uh, the only time you really want to push straight down a lane is if no one is there. And I think that's what a lot of players struggle with, is that they'll push down the middle of the lane when someone is there. So you just end up getting shot and dying for free without really getting any shots off first. Now, one thing that like clicked with me all of a sudden is, like, because you know we talk a lot about on the show um, the importance of of being aggressive and if you're playing trials or skirmish and you get a pick and you've got the other team outnumbered, you know, it's go time. You got to push, 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 push. This is pretty common sweat advice. And I had trouble matching that up with my practice because I'd say, okay, okay, it's go time. And I jump over the top of the box and I try and get to them as soon as I can to shoot them with my shotgun. And I never really had a destination in mind except to like get to wherever they are and, I plan never got much farther than that. Um, so this idea that you have a destination when you're pushing and you, you you sort of have a specific idea of not only where you want to go, but the the motion you're going to take to get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so basically there's different paths you can take to push. I think a, a problem that a lot of players have when they hear push is that, like you said, you get into your head where you just got to get right to that orb to cover it. But the idea of a push isn't necessarily to sit on the orb, it's to control it. And so control implies that you apply pressure onto your opponents. So you can apply pressure from afar, all your guns are ranged. So all you really need to do is get to a point where if they move up to the orb, you can get shots off on them. That's a successful push. Um, Obviously, based on your loadout, your push lethality is uh is going to change based on what you're using so like if you want to push with a shotgun you need to be you know in that 10 meter range where you can slide shotgun if you want to push with a sniper you can stay a lot further back um, and still be able to cover an orb a common example of this is uh, a res snipe you can still apply pressure with the res snipe um, without necessarily pushing for very far okay so i want to push into cover what is cover and how do i push into it so cover is it's basically any piece of map geometry that's going to protect you from gunfire. So if there's a box in front of you and you can't see through it and you can't see around it and you just move up to it, you're undercover. So that means from your perspective, you can't see the enemy, but from the enemy's perspective, they can't see you. And there's diff- varying levels of cover. There's complete cover, which would be like you're behind a box and no one can see you. And there's partial cover, which would also be known as a head glitch. So if you push to, uh, let's say, the little shelf on the back of Burning Shrine outside, uh, if you play Trials, I'm sure everyone knows where that spot is. All you can see uh, if you're the enemy is that player's head that's out on that shelf. But if you're the player on the shelf, you get full view of everyone else. So that's a perfect example of pushing uh, to go going to a location uh, and being behind cover. And it's also normally when you can, you're in a, a, an area where you can head glitch, it's very easy for you to crouch down and then be completely in full cover once again. So in the middle of an engagement, if it's going poorly for you, you can just dip down and then run away if you have to. One of the biggest things I have a problem with is uh, 
knowing when to escape because I will crouch down into cover and be like, oh crap, they're shooting, they're shooting. And then uh, think I have the out, like the run, uh, but I don't have enough health yet. And one of the biggest things I have to work on is uh, waiting until I have enough health and not panicking because I'm being shot at. Right. And I mean, that can be a big issue too for when you get pushed, when you're weak behind cover, because you have to decide, you know, how are they going to end up pushing you? If they do end up pushing you through their own cover, how can you, you know, there's certain times where it'll be safe for you to leave because they'll be behind cover and not in a position where they can actually hit you. And if they decide to push outside of cover, that's your opportunity to get free shots off on them. You, you know, for me, it took a while, like this seems so obvious, but like it took a while to kind of trust that cover is cover that even if like in terms of just straight distance, you're relatively close to someone else. If you are fully behind cover, they can't shoot you. And that requires just a lot of map knowledge. You have to know at any given point on the map, what are the angles? Are there three different angles I'm exposed on? Are there two? Could I really just cut it down to, you know, I'm totally behind this box and there's only one angle from the distance I could be shot at. Um, I remember watching you, Keen, uh, just run around a map on your own, just a 30 minute rumble, just looking around. And I spent, an entire 30 minute rumble on burning shrine, just going, Oh, if I stand here and I crouch, then there's only one approach. If I stand up now there's two. So as long as I can keep track of where people are, I can kind of trust that the cover is going to work like cover, which is at least for me, more of a a leap of faith than I thought it would be. Yeah. It's, it's not something that you consciously think about for the most part until someone tells you, Hey, you need to do this. And then, and then it's there pretty much always. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you put you put a worm in my ear. I've not been able to get out. Yeah, I mean that's a good thing though. Moving in and out of cover really really helps you win engagements that normally you wouldn't. So let's say I'm playing Rumble. Uh, so cut it down to to just the basics of one v one encounter after one v one encounter. What does you know the first two minutes of a match look like, or just you know one life look like pushing in and out of cover? Uh, so off spawn, I'm going to look around and immediately try to find the first spot I'm going to be undercover. Normally, uh, the way the maps are designed, you're not, not really far further away from cover than a couple of seconds. So it's pretty easy just to figure out, okay, if I go here, I'm going to be undercover from, you know, one angle, whether it be in front of me or beside me or anything. Then I'm going to start looking around, uh, to try to acquire targets and checking my radar And then after that, I'm going to either jump or slide into my next set of cover. Again, trying to pick a keen clip is it's tough, man. He's given us a lot of good advice over the years. Uh, But I thought that one really summed it up for him. Um, But I think there's more to it than that. Keen's kind of talking about the the ideas and the concepts and the decision making. But there's also an art to physically moving around in this game. And there was one piece of advice I had to make sure uh, we, we heard from. Uh, this is from uh, episode 147 with our good buddy and official Crucible Radio intern. You can have whatever title you want, buddy. He's the intern. Uh, this <laughs> is from our good buddy, Dr. Grimm, from his episode with Simply Forth. How can we kill those two people, follow up with the other two, get to the other side of the map as quickly as possible using whatever terrain we have? Um, you, you could bounce off the ceiling with a warlock or... You can Titan skate or you can, like I say, bounce your head off the wall with a hunter and just try and get yourself there so you can <laughs> so you can get yourself in an optimal position. Yeah, I can say uh, it, <laughs> I feel like I've started every sentence with this, but it is really a shock to see just how fast, fast players move around the mm-hmm. map when they're rotating, where it's just everything to try and keep up with it. It is it is breakneck speed and just just your best kind of movement just to be able to keep up with good players as they rotate around Hmm. Uh, it's a shock (laughs) Uh, it's a lot harder to track someone visually who's going at the speed of the flash Mm -hmm. yeah go figure right (laughs) with science okay grim what about you uh movement what should people be doing Oh man. So, you know, I think with movement, my number one tip is sliding around. I think sliding is one of the most important things you can do in the game because it's temporarily taking you off radar. You know, it's very good. It makes you a harder target to hit. And the fact of the matter is, I think this is one of my favorite things that D2 did from D1. 
is the fact that you can slide pretty much infinitely with no sprint lock and you won't just start walking randomly. And so I see no reason not to slide. I think that's absolutely. I agree with that. But uh, to weigh in on movement... Always be sliding. Always be sliding, yes. Uh, to weigh in on movement, I think the fastest way around the map is if you're on a Warlock, to Warlock Surf. If you're on a Titan, to do sort of a Titan burst kind of glide, you know, you're holding your jump, just going in a, a horizontal line, and then uh, Hunter, you know, use your strafe jump to get around the map. But I think the thing that's really important about movement is, for me at least, is the single greatest tool for outplay potential in this game. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you move so well that your opponent misses all their shots on you or you get into a position where you can exploit getting behind them and all that and just, you know, give yourself a massive advantage in a fight. That is so, so essential in doing well in this game. So birds, I think right around the time you showed up, Swain fell asleep. We should just keep chugging along though, right? I know he's, he's so precious. We'll wake him up at the end. I don't want to disturb that. That sounds, that sounds right. All right. Uh, We're at gold now. This is, this is where it starts getting serious. This is where, like I said at the beginning, uh, the most players fall. And this is where you start learning how to rise above and actually push your game further as opposed to just, you know, understanding the core, the basics and having some decent gun skills. So you really got to push forward now. So this next clip, I know we played a Bones clip last episode and I wasn't looking for one for me, but I was listening back to episode three And I said something for the first time. I'm sure I repeated it many times after that. But this to me, that that we we had a sense of this so early on, I think meant that we were onto something. We were kind of at that gold level when we were getting started. I just like to think so. Um, This is about the word meta. The meta comes into play at at this gold level. Uh, This is from episode three with ya boy Birdsy. So, you know, every time a new expansion comes out, there's a huge reboot to the current thinking that is part of the meta. Um, And I think it's easy to fall into a trap of like two weeks in. It's like, okay, we got these three new shotguns and we got this one sniper and these have got the best stats and here's how we use them. Mm -hmm. And to think, okay, we are essentially static until the next expansion. But it's just not true. I mean, I think my favorite example of that was the rise and fall of the ambush scope. (laughs) When I started playing, if you had a sniper, you had ambush or you threw it out. It just wasn't worth it. Um, And look, ambush is still a deadly scope and it is very effective in a lot of ways. Um, But what we found with a lot of, uh, especially just with a lot of community interaction and seasoned snipers who've never really talked about it come out and say, oh yeah, I use short gaze, it's got more aim assist, or I use the long view, it's got more aim assist, and it's got more stability. I mean, we thought this was a solved problem, and it's very <laughs> easy to fall in that trap of if somebody says, what sniper scope should I use? You might not even, you, know, you haven't done the research, probably. You haven't compared them side by side. Um, and you just sort of repeat what you've heard. Uh, and that's that's a dangerous trap to fall into. I mean, the right scope is not only going to be you know, the one with the best stats or the one that looks the best, it's going to be map dependent. It's going to be opponent dependent, or maybe the right scope is actually a barrel because <laughs> you're using a shotgun instead, which I recommend, but. That's yeah. just- <laughs> wow. Episode three birds. That was a long time ago. I a little baby birdsy, but I still had the voice. I had, I didn't always have this voice. I had to grow this voice, but even then I'm <laughs> starting to do like this kind of thing. Well, yeah. That sweet kid I was. All right, we got another Holtz clip coming up, and Holtz talked about something important. Actually, these next two clips are interesting, and uh, Holtz is talking about radar. We've got a uh, a fan of the no radar coming up right after, <laughs> um, and I think that to me is interesting, right? That there can be things that you like in this game, things that you dislike, things that you think make the game good, or things that if they were gone would make the game better. But it doesn't change the fact that we have to play the same game that we have when we play it together. So uh, I thought these two set up a bit of a nice contrast. Uh, this is from episode 30, again, with our buddy Holtz. A lot of people say, you know, the, uh, the radar, it's so difficult to, you know, get a flank off on someone because it's so easy to play defensively using the radar. I, it's one of the mind games, I think, that you can use with this is you can use the radar offensively like you can... You can just be a presence on their radar in a place where you could flank them from, and then they're going to they're gonna have to devote one person to looking at you, and you're in a good superior position to flank from as well. So that's kind of always going to be in the back of their minds. Oh, there's this guy that's really close uh, to us on the radar. We better watch out for it. Maybe send two people there or, or something, and then 
you can get a superior flank off from another angle or get a pick off and then start gaining momentum uh, on the round. That was one of the things I took away from Bungie when we went was uh, mm-hmm. Leif, Leif telling us all about finding places on the map that you can just mess with people's heads with using mm-hmm. the ma- using the radar. So that's, you- that's why I like the radar so much in this game. <laughs> and pe- uh, I, I find the Inferno mode so frustrating because the absence of the radar doesn't really improve uh, the game modes in the way that uh, people normally expect it to. In a lot of games like Call of Duty, Counter Strike, you know, you're li- you're listening for those footsteps, you're listening for those other, you know, audio cues or callouts mm-hmm. from your teammates, and it's just not there in Destiny. There's not enough audio information, there's not enough visual information coming in from other sources to really make up for that lack of radar. Well, I think the nice thing too is like, you know, if you prefer radar or not, at least it doesn't do the thing where it just has a little blip, you know, it tells you exactly yep. where they are. You need to use it and you need to understand it. And it's it's kind of fun when you do kind of get a feel for it and it's not just saying, he is 20 meters away standing right here. You have to mm-hmm. know what it's really trying to tell you. And then that can build some yep. strategy. The one thing I do like about the Warlock jump is that you can floof about in the air for a really long time and you can really mess with people in door in, in doorways. And so yeah. Yeah. Where is he? Yeah. <laughs> he's right there. He's, he's, he's right on the radar. What the hell? He should be in here. And then, you know, you just eat a shotgun round from the top of your head. Because he's been floating about. Very satisfying. Yeah, very satisfying. Now, all right, buckle up, everyone. I said last week, Birds, you asked, you know, what was your light bulb moment? I said I had a few, mm. but one that stands out to me the most is when we started talking to Mr. Fizzer. And he explained the game to me in a way I had not seen it almost from without the from out of the first person perspective to seeing it as a top down strategy game, learning positioning and spawns. This guy just knows this game and sees it differently than everyone else. And this is from episode eight way back in the day. But it's great. Here's Fizzer. There's a quote in one of your videos that really stuck with me because I'm trying to learn how to snipe. And you had said in one of your videos you know, people ask me how I'm so good at sniping and it's because I'm positioned well. Can you talk a bit about that? Because, like, I would like sniping to be mm-hmm. easier. <laughs> yeah, and uh, to get into understanding how to position yourself well, you have to first understand how the maps work. I think one of the beautiful things is that uh, Bungie has um, set up these maps in a way that It's consistent where a flag is always going to be a more dominant flag to hold than C. And why is that? Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of different reasons to it. And I know that there's a common misconception that C and B is a great setup to work with. But one of the biggest flaws about holding C and you can test this out on your own if, if you play. If you pick any point behind C flag or around C flag, when you look at one angle in front of you, one line of sight, you're always exposing your left or your right or your backside or something uh, out there. So the way that these maps are designed is that around C, there's just too many angles. It doesn't matter how good of a player you are. You can't cover all of them. But on uh, if you flip it and you stand behind A flag, you have objects and lines of sight that you can eliminate certain angles so you can focus on a target individually rather than uh, a scatter of multiple targets. So... You can put yourself behind a rock or behind a wall and just focus on one angle at a time. And you get to choose how many angles you're looking at, whether it be one or you move advance a little bit further towards B. And now you're looking at a couple more angles and a couple more. So you get to adjust the gauge of how much you want to challenge uh, other opponents, um, depending on how much health you have or how many people are coming at you and all these kind of things. And it puts you in a lot more control in the first place rather than standing out in the wide open. So does this uh, strategy work on new maps? Like say you go into the Taken King, brand new map you've never been on. Is uh, the A-B strategy work on, you're going to try that first or are you going to feel at the map? Um, first thing first, would it would definitely be able to feel at the map because it just so happened that um, whoever created the maps for Destiny and decided the flag points kept it consistent. So I would assume that going into Taking King, they're going to keep up with that consistency of it. But we may never know. They could change it around. It didn't come from necessarily the flag being titled A, where I'm like, oh, that's the one we want to hold. It became just from Halo knowledge of, you know, if you're familiar with Halo, 
then you'll know that height advantage and being able to eliminate these angles and, and allow you to focus on just one target at a time um, while not being shot by another one is a massive thing in the first place to becoming successful. So um, it doesn't really matter where the flags are placed as long as the game, like the map is functioning correctly. You know what I mean? So you talk about that vertical aspect to it. Um, I mean, I, I, a big difference between Halo and Destiny is that Destiny's got maps that are very asymmetrical, both from a horizontal point of view and from a vertical point of view. I mean, are there any rules of thumb for how you want to use that asymmetry to your advantage? Um, definitely. I would say in Halo there really were, but the crazy thing to me, and I definitely praise the people that have made the maps in, in Destiny because they're so good at creating an optical illusion in front of you where you may be on a, a higher advantage spot, but it's a harder angle for you to hit sometimes. Um, the majority of the time, like if there's a box or a unit that I can jump on to give me a little height advantage, I usually do that because that's that's going to make your shot easier, easier to strafe and easier to just land those shots. But it's also a lot harder for your opponent. But there are a couple situations like Shores of Time where a flag feels like it's on low ground, but because of the angling of the map, it's actually a really strong position to be at. Okay, so talking about positioning and stuff like that, and what is a setup, and how do you get yourself in a setup? I was recently watching uh, a little clip on Widow's Court, and you really emphasize the show your, notes. <laughs> you know, controlling that uh, the little hut up there and stuff like that. Do you? Do you want to prioritize that over everything, run right there and get there, or do you want to work your way over? How does that setup come into play? I think one of the most important things about that depends on um, are you playing alone or do you have a unit that you're working with um, because that will justify what you can get away with and what you actually want to spend your time doing. Um, say I do spawn on an area that I don't like and I want to work my way to the high ground or to something that I'm trying to hold I definitely don't just say drop everything and go right there because you need to uh, just whittle your way there, get a couple kills on the way, and it will start the spawn cycle to be in your favor where the other team's going to start spawning behind you. Um, sometimes, if you're playing alone, sometimes it is nice to just go ahead and sneak behind and, and get a strong spot. But to really answer your question about like mm -hmm. what a setup would be or how it really works is um, depending on how many players you have, say you have three or or four or five or six but initially that first person has to set up in the strongest spot which would be behind a flag and then there are positions all the way up to b that a player can fill in on and they can hold those spots and effectively you keep the other team spawning on the c area of the map and those angles are very harsh for them to come upwards. Like it's almost like a hill, you know. If you're on top of the hill, it's very easy to shoot downwards, and it's very easy to keep your opponents pinched down there and spawning at the bottom of the hill. It's really hard for them to walk upwards, and effectively, you're just going to choke the other team out. And this is how you get the wins where the point difference is massive, and you leave them with under a thousand points, or you know, just with five hundred points. And you do that by once you get a dominant spot, you don't let go of it until the other team earns it from you, you know? Mm -hmm. Is the difference between skirmish and control just how many people you have to set up a power point and, like, how many people you can base around this one focal point? Or does what makes sense in skirmish, does that differ from what makes sense in control? Um, yeah, you're, I mean, you're basically correct. It's just the more players means that there's more spaces to be filled in. But as long as you have the solid points... Uh, held down which you could do um, with just a couple people you know like say you're playing skirmish and you want to set that three up in a unit and it can hold something down a good example would be twilight gap if you want to use like behind a flag in the rock section back there and then another one above b bridge and then somebody else floating in between there that's good three players and now that you have six everyone can just kind of fill in an area in between there so what would you tell people about uh, some people might think that these static positions are boring that I would probably agree with you on the fact that they can be boring at times, but it also depends on the resistance that the enemy team is putting up. If you're not playing against the world's greatest players, these kind of setups don't even really come into light. But once you start to play against uh, a really solid team that knows how to hold these positions and if they take them away from you and never give it back to you, you're going to have a really rough time coming back into that game. 
So it's really just more so about playing to win versus playing what would really be quote unquote fun. Because I know a lot of people have a good time just running blink shotgun and just running wherever you want to go and right into their base, right into their spawn. But what you're doing when you do that is you're blocking like spawns for your team. So let's say you take uh, right from A flag, you run right down the map, you blink shotgun into their base, into C, and you start getting a couple kills. Now you're forcing them to spawn behind your teammates. So it's kind of, um, it can really screw you over if you're playing against really good players. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of this positioning stuff, or at least I feel like it, you know, it kind of assumes that you have a comfortable control on gunplay and reaction time and stuff like that. But what are you, what would you say is a good way to start developing those kind of skills? You know, if you have to, before you're worrying about everyone else on the map and what do you, how do you prepare yourself? And, and I know obviously it's, it's time put into the game, but do you have any tips to just develop, you know, how you handle your own gun? Is there anything you're keeping in mind while you're playing besides, you know, strategy and positioning? What, what comes down to the player itself, you know? One of the easiest ways to get into it is just realizing that strong positioning in general will give you an easy shot. So, you know, it's not like you have to have the world's greatest shot. It's it's more so about if you're standing in the right spot, the shot becomes easy. And if you learn how to do that correctly, you're just going to naturally improve. So my biggest advice for somebody that's looking to try this out and it's a lot easier to see in Inferno. And I know sometimes people are a little nervous about going into an Inferno playlist all by themselves. You don't have the comfortability of the radar to know what's going on, and it can be a little scary. But if you do go into that uh, playlist, I recommend starting out behind a flag and just just staying there. You know, this may take a couple games to get into, but I think if you can just kind of hang out in that area you'll start to get a, a feel of how it goes. There's a couple of good patterns, and the angle will always be in your favor. So even if you play a game out and you don't get very many kills, just look at it was, did you win your individual battles? And that's, that's where you want to start. Now, after you've gotten that, you can kind of build up and figure out how to move out of that position and move forward over towards B flag and start to really control the map in a way. So to really answer your question, I really think... It all goes hand in hand. Positioning helps your shot, and ha- you know you will learn that stuff if you start at the right at the right spot. So if you can take your time with it and just start at working behind a flag and just work your way forward, and you know just take it as whenever you're ready to move up, you'll move up. Also, a lot of it comes into play of where your teammates can stand to support you. So sometimes when I'm playing alone, I just hang out in that area because I know that if I move up. Nobody else is going to like hold that area behind me, and, and the setup collapses in completely. So it's not like it's uh, an unadvanced tactic to do that thing. It's just it'll be something very comfortable for you to do. So the positioning and the setups and stuff go hand in hand with you know making that gun skill easier, and that and those one v ones go a little easier because you're starting off from a better spot. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I think one of the most important things that I've learned is. You know, just by playing Halo with and against some of the best players in the world, if you have no margin to give them, like the person that you're playing against, any advantage, because when you play against the people that aren't going to miss a single shot, you don't have the luxury of doing so. So that's why it's really important to start in a spot that gives you the strongest advantage on the map and in the game. I think what we're talking about right here is pretty radically different from the way most people approach the crucible. I mean, I know for sure it just made sense to me when, you know, when I was first starting off, like you start somewhere in the map and then you go run around and you find some people and you get them. And what you're saying is that we, you really want to pick an area and control that area. And a lot of this has to do with spawns. So for somebody who doesn't understand spawns, you know, we don't show up on the map randomly after we die. Give us spawn 101. How does that work? Spawn 101 is going to work based on where you are on the map and where your enemy teams are on the map. The game is always going to try and give you the most advantageous spawn that you can get um, on map positioning. But it's also not going to, it's going to try its best not to spawn you right next to uh, an enemy. Sometimes you do, but that's, that's what this whole positioning thing is about. So that you can orchestrate and coordinate 
the enemy team spawns to always spawn in a in a, a harder angle to fight out of so that you have the advantage to win your battles over and over and over again um and so the basic stuff about spawns is just learning how to read the spawn that you get when i spawn in i look exactly at where the players are around me and most of the time uh i see a lot of players doing this when i watch streams sometimes somebody will spawn in and they'll do a complete like 180 and turn right back around and you don't really want to do that you have to trust in in the game giving you a good spawn because the destiny spawn system is actually pretty advanced and it's actually really good you just have to learn to trust in it and um a lot of it comes from knowing how the map works and knowing the route to be taking after you get that spawn so the setup is designed to say, okay, we're going to control this section of the map. So the game is going to put all of the enemies that we kill off on some other part of the map. So if we're locking down A, they're not going to put us in A with them. They're going to put them over on C. What can what can happen to a team that might jeopardize that control of where people spawn? Um, well, one of the biggest things is, is just you start to lose, like it, it breaks the, the map into straight chaos if you don't really keep it on a, on a controlled point. One of the common things that I see when I play with my subscribers, and they've actually gotten really good with it, I've been really uh, impressed with how much the people that watch my channel want to learn and learn these things and implement it. So I enjoy mostly playing with my subs that are, um, you know, just because they get some of these concepts and they're, it's so easy to play around when they just don't do um, some things that would cause complete chaos on the map. Every now and then we'll have a solid A and B setup, and it'll be the early part of the game, maybe two minutes into the game. The games are like 12 minutes long, so you got to think, you know, there's still a lot left. There's a lot of time. Just because you got the setup doesn't mean you go crazy and just run into C. The idea is that you leave um, C flag as it is. You let the enemy team spawn there. And C is generally a decently large amount of space for spawns, but as there is usually a choke point that right when they try to come through, you will have the advantageous angle. And that's what you're looking for. And some people, um, they want to go right from B and just go blink and get into C and pick up maybe two or three kills. Now, what you've done is you've gotten, you've, sure, you've gotten the two or three kills and you feel good about it. What you've done is you've also ran through a lot of spawn points, blocked a lot of them, and you're now forcing um, more influence on those people you just killed to spawn behind your and behind your own team in an even stronger spot than where you're set up. So it's very dangerous. But when you start doing that and you start to play against good players that will understand how this works, they're going to get a free flank on your teammates. And effectively, if they do it right, they could wipe your whole entire team and take your setup directly like right from underneath your feet. I think that's a great clip to take us out of gold and into platinum. Um, you know, Fizz is a fan of the static setup. It's a thing that we still haven't seen that much of, but when it works, it works. Um, but he does talk about positioning, and uh, once you've got that in play, then you can start to get clever with it. You can start moving a little bit faster. We're getting into the platinum tier where you're really getting those those mind games, those advanced mechanics in touch. And... Uh, no one better to talk to than the. <laughs> would he be upset if I called him a trials rat, the, uh, <laughs> Mr. Boldness the... <laughs> himself? <laughs> yep. Um, th th this guy's just a delightful human being, but he also knows what he's doing in that playlist. Uh, this is from episode one eighteen. Our buddy Joverated. So, how do you create those instances where you, uh, you know, have a, have an ability to pick people off? I, I mean, I'm sure Blink has a lot to do with it. It's, it's mostly just picking your battles. Um, you'll you'll go around a corner, and if there are two or three people, you just got to immediately disengage and go find a different lane, different angle. Maybe try flanking. Flanking, I've found, is a huge way to get kills in Trials of the Nine because in Destiny 2, your radar goes away for like two seconds after you de-scope. So mm -hmm. if you have a lot longer to go behind them and just start picking them off, and they'll have no idea where it's coming from. So it's basically just picking your battles, knowing when uh, to fight and when to fall back especially with low recovery and all this team shotting going on. How are you incorporating flanking into something that requires you to be a little bit more team oriented? Uh, um, I feel like, I feel like flanking is a little tougher simply because you have to be able to be like, all right, guys, I'm going to go do this. Uh, you guys stay here. Uh, but if you're teaching people on the fly, how are you, uh, 
incorporating flanking? Yeah, mostly flanking is hard to teach. Um, I guess the best way would just to be watch, watching how I do it or how others do it because how I would do it is I would split up. When I was doing triple carries, most of the time I split them up like by them, like all three of them to go over one way and then just try to team shot or like fall back if you're hurt. And then I would sneak around. So they would just like keep their fire and like keep distracting. And then I would come up from behind and just take them all out. So flanking is a hard thing to master because you can instantly, instantly get caught. You know, if you, if you pull up and then they see you on the radar, they're just all going to turn around and team shot you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's a very, it's a very high risk, high reward, especially, I don't know if you know, the on the map eternity there is that one spot like next to the spawn um with the more open spawn that was this little platform you could just get behind him and kill everybody do you guys know what i'm talking about like way in the back of the spawn that that platform uh, on defense on it well it switches but the one where you spawn i guess outside more open and then like uh no when you're attacking when you're attacking when you spawn right, in right, on, right. and on the right, there's that platform. If you're on defense, you can sneak all the way around and then get on that platform. Oh yeah, and then yeah. all four will have no idea where you are. And it was that was a good spot. It was an evil spot, but it was a good spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th- there's nothing like quite as satisfying as like coming around a corner and seeing three yeah, people and they have no and they're idea. All hard scoped and none of them are facing you. It's beautiful. Yeah, I noticed one one piece of communication that you had when you were executing a flank that I think is. There's, there's probably a lot to this is that when you were saying, okay, I'm going to go flank the, the thing you kept saying is like, okay, don't die, <laughs> get your health. Like there, there, when you commit to doing the flank, you sort of start the timer for how long it's going to take for you to get around. And that kind of requires your teammates to not fully commit to, to work an angle, to get their health, to have the standoff, but to keep the engagement going long enough for you to get in position. Cause if they all die and you flanked, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's really not really a flank this. anymore. Um, yeah, staying alive, I think is one is an, is also another really important part of this trials because of the res timers, you can't pick people up for a long time and having a three on four advantage with team shotting is huge. Um, so the main thing was just staying alive, wait for me to try and get over there. If I can get a pick great, if I can't, I'll just fall back. Okay. So if you're an avid listener, episode 103 is when we first did, did these ranks and we had to pull this clip. You'll know it. When you hear it, this is Lupo and Ramblin' mastering callouts. Yep, you got one push them off, two push them off right now. One's on Spark, one's pushing you. Uh, one on Spark's fading back, one is out of boxes right now getting res. Uh, on their window inside, drop it down, run back to Spark spawn. Cut him back towards the window. He's in window now. In window still. Right side of the window, drop down, push it in the lobby. Push it in the lobby, he's hiding behind a box. I, I push it out. Got all three right there. It's a triple tether. One more. Watch the nade. Watch the nade, slow play. GL on this kid. Slides and the rolls going. There you go. Shit, my res is right there. Excellent play. Excellent, excellent play. Ten seconds. Bring it home, Guardian. I'm pushing out to the towards the control point. You're in overtime. End the round. Excellent job. The zone. Excellent, excellent job. You did exactly what you do the whole time. It's perfect. Another aspect of uh, your game that we're all jealous of is something that, you know, uh, comes a lot when you're dead. So, uh, I don't know. Are you dead a lot that you get the chance to do callouts so often? That, that first Ramblin' video that blew up where it was it was Bannerfall. Oh, and man. He's just dancing around the map, but look. Ramblin' is amazing, but that video would not have happened had it not been for just like these cool, calm, collected callouts. Um, wh- how do you keep that going? How how do you pull that off? I laugh when I watch that video now. 
the, the number of comments that are, does that, is that guy an air traffic controller? Does he work for NASA? Is he in the military? Nope. I'm an IT nerd, guys. Sorry. Uh, uh, I, I'm kind of disappointed to find out you're not a real doctor. I, what? We can get... Uh, 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 listen, I gotta go. I'll get, I'll get you guys. <laughs> get out. <laughs> no, the, uh, the call-outs thing, the communication, it's funny. When you get into a... Like I said before, I, I knew Ramblin was going to win that round. He had to get nine kills to do it, but going into it, I had just, you just you have to know, otherwise things are going to fall apart. And so if I'm dead, and even at the beginning of that clip, you can hear me say something about just throwing my, my lives away because I'm just running out into open, stupid lanes. But the benefit to that is I get to ghost for the remainder of the game, and as big of a detriment as it can be in trials, uh, our other teammate was dead as well. So I had three vantage points, my, you know, my ghost, uh, the Sherpies ghost, and Ramblin', to monitor the situation from. And so when we go into something like that where I need to start com communicating positioning, you have to remember that your teammate can only see what he can see. You can see everything else. And depending on the position of the ghosts, you have such a wide field of view of the map, especially on Bannerfall. The map out outside by Mohawk is so open. You have the tree area and the little boxes underneath each snipe ledge. You've got even vision into both sides lobbies if you're in the right, if your your ghost is in the right position. Granted, I don't think there's any right position to die in. You got to try <laughs> and stay alive. But I was lucky enough that I had those kind of locations that I could view. The other part of that is is being able to really communicate efficiently. And so when I when we talk about callouts, especially when Taken King came out. We went into these new maps with no prior knowledge of, of anything. And I think that was great because it gave us the opportunity to develop callouts as we went along. So mm. most of that play takes place in one of the lobbies. And the lobby is where the, you have that, the top uh, cubby hole building up top. There's that snipe walkway, the bridge into both, you know, into the building. You've got the doorway from outside by Mohawk. You've got top window and the doorway below it. You have the boxes in the lobby. There's all these positions that you can get really specific with. And the biggest piece of that is efficiency. You'll notice at no point are we ever doing callouts that are that are more than maybe three syllables tops. You got to get the communication as fast as possible, as efficient as you can, without saying things like, oh my God, he's on top of you. That doesn't really <laughs> say much. Or right there, look out. That doesn't help me. You know, telling, telling people, someone like Ramblin, especially, oh man, I think in that clip there was a shot that he pulled where I counted the time before the guy got in the top window and he just flicked over, popped the dude in the face right when I said that, that he was there and just went, went about his business. That kind of thing will help in such a huge way. And I have to tell you, it's kind of just a, a flow, a, an open stream of consciousness as far as those, those kind of things go. I, I, I got to say, like, I... There's a part of me that believes that that one clip is the single most important clip in all of Destiny. It might or be. the Crucible, at least. Yeah. Like, if not, it's up there. Just in terms of, of the, the way it changed the game for people. And the way it should be done. I mean, speaking of the way it should be done, um, I had a lot of trouble with this next one because now we're in the <laughs> diamond. Oh, boy. We're talking about the highest level of team play. And... Um, You'll notice the caption I put for this one is the whole fucking episode. Um, <laughs> That's what he wrote. It's right there. Yep. Yeah. Next week, we start the cruises. We're going to have some fun. I assume like best episode or best episode for <laughs> getting good is going to come up. And this one has my vote. It's, it's everything we've covered in this episode and then some. It's one of a kind. Uh, this is episode 182 with Cap. I, yeah, I, I'm, I don't even want to taint it by trying to describe it. So here's where we really kind of take a deep dive because you, you, you helped establish kind of the baseline. Okay, I stack X amount of super mods. I have certain type of, of exotic. I'll get this much mathematically more super energy. But there's so much more to it than that, especially in comp. You really have to understand playing your life. Much like in Overwatch and the damage stat, the longer you stay alive, the greater your damage is going to be. I love that stat in comp because it translates so well. It shows a true contribution to the team. 
you have to stay alive. To maximize your super energy potential, not only do you have to be there for the kills because you get a little bit off of assists, you get a lot more off of kills, but just the time staying alive. So loadouts right now that are popular that support that, um, assuming the five super mods, Dragon Shadow on Hunter, um, that evasion is huge because it does two things. One, it gets you out of line of fire, but two, it gives you a free third person view, which, in, which is crucial in, in looking around those corners and setting up what you want to do next. Um, a lot of survivability in that situation. Another good one is transverse of steps for the Warlocks because that sprint and slide increase, same thing, gets you out of sticky situations bad, reloads your weapons for you, does a lot for you. Um, any exotic, any sort of loadout centered around keeping you alive longer is going to benefit that super energy meta, as well as maximizing kills. Um, and really for each class, there's really only two or three I would say top tier viable builds to support the absolute nth degree of super collection. Uh, but, you know, to be fair, it's not all about supers. You do have to have the gun skill, you do have to win the fights. Um, so you have to balance that out as well. So I wonder how you kind of deal with high risk, high reward scenarios when it comes to playing for your super. And let's just say mm -hmm. we're playing, you know, Clash, right? There's, you know, they're, they're, there's not rounds. I don't have to worry about capturing a control point or you know having my my ghost in a good place or anything like that. Um, and I have a situation where okay, I want to stay alive as much as possible. I want to keep my uptime up, so I'm kind of constantly building that super. But at the same time, I've got my shotgun out. It's fully loaded. I got plenty of ammo, and I see what could be a great push that I accept I might die, but I feel like I feel good. I can pick up two kills, maybe three kills. Uh, if I really commit to it, I'm probably going to die in the process. Kind of what's the calculus there? Is it worth it to get those kills to kind of, you know, get the momentum going for my team, maybe generate an orb or two? Uh, or should I be thinking about, okay, it's good, it's a risk, but really I'm going to serve my team best by staying alive and not overcommitting. How do you balance those two things? So I think it's really interesting that you said, you know, picking a basic game mode like Clash. And why I said it's interesting is because it's kind of a misnomer because that is an objective game mode. It's hidden as just team deathmatch. But there are what I would call micro-objectives involved uh, that a lot of people don't realize, such as maintaining map control. And map control is more than just A, B, or C. It's what we call in Halo points of domination. So what are the points of domination on a map that are key to you to retain and give you an advantage, but also key to deny to the enemy? So any time that you can fight for or secure a point of domination, that takes precedence over being passive and preserving energy. The only time you should really be passive and preserving energy is if you lost somebody you're setting up to wait for a heavy box or something, um, or you're regrouping and preparing to push. You ideally want to be in this constant state of push, um, always moving forward, always moving from one point of domination to the other so that you don't allow the other team to kind of uh, reach some sort of a balance and equilibrium and able to fight back. You want to keep them off their game as much as possible. Um, and if that means you die, that's fine, because what you're doing is you're opening opportunities and angles for your teammates. Uh, that's always worth the trade. Anytime you can open up opportunities to set your um, left and rights up for success, you're going to be in a good spot. Um, as opposed to some people that I know that just dive in for the kills. That's great. <laughs> if your team's not ready for that collapse, as we call mm -hmm. it, or that coordinated push, then really all you're doing is you're feeding. Um, I like to use a lot of MOBA analogies when I talk about high-level Destiny play because it's about resource management, map placement, communications, coordination. So much of what you see in Overwatch or in Dota, it doesn't apply necessarily to the macro game of Destiny, but the micro game of Destiny is absolutely a battle of resources. Who has what ammo? Who has what abilities on or off cooldown? Who's in what position to push here or there? Um, so there's a lot more to it than that. And, and I, I think it's great that you mentioned Clash because really Clash is a perfect example of micro objectives, points of domination, um, resource management, because whoever rotates the best, and by rotate, I mean whoever moves around from point of domination to point of domination and slays will win. 
as opposed to sitting back and trying to preserve super energy. So um, you gave us topics. We're going to have to revisit a lot of these. Sure. Um, but I want to zoom back out to this boot camp. And I think actually it would be curious to hear um, Bones from you. I mean, you, you attended one of these boot camps. Um, when you were first coming in and you were answering these questions of what's my preferred loadout, what's my play style, what do I think my my strong at suits are and what are my weaknesses? What answers did you give for those questions? Oh, wow. Yeah, that was, um, it was like right off the bat, just, it's, it's kind of funny because, you know, I can, I can throw down in this game. It's not like I'm bad, but that experience was like a way to reevaluate my approach in such a different level. So when I was thinking about that and especially with the other guys giving answers and stuff like that, like I know I'm not a fast player. You know, I need to work on my reaction speed, but I, I'm not the first person into the fight. I'm not the push leader. I'm not the, the, the aggro slayer. So I was saying that, yeah, so like I'm, I sort of play more positionally. You know, I want to be in the right spot. I want to know when power is spawning. I want to be uh, on the angles to, to help get cleanup kills and make sure that I'm not just stuck off in 1v1s getting, you know, or getting swarmed by the team and separated from my from my team. So that immediately uh, cap was you labeled as a, a control player, not the game mode, but just a control as a, a player who controls a zone, who, who knows where the flow of the game is going uh, and isn't. And then the slayers take over the, the role of pushing in and, and full on attack. And that was great because, you know, I'm using Luna's and a shotgun, the same thing. And my build is, is as meta as I can make it. Cause that's how I like to play. But it gave me a different purpose for using that. And then when we moved on to scrims, I felt like I fit into a team on a different level because I've scrimmed before and I've played in tournaments before. But previously, it's like, okay, it's just four good people trying to beat four good people. Everyone try to do the best. But when you have like a purpose and a play style and a loadout that fits you, you you just work better (laughs) because you're doing things with purpose rather than just abstractly, I hope I win. So let's, I mean, let's, let's dive in there. I love this idea that there are kind of these distinct identities for different types of players, more than just the loadout that you use. Um, you know, Bones, you mentioned, you know, realizing you were a control player. Cap, can you kind of walk us through what are the major archetypes of players? Sure. So I, I think on your typical team, and I'll kind of zoom back out to my Halo days, you know, terminology varies. There was, it was the Wild West back then. There was no Halo League. It was just groups of good players that said, we're going to form a team and we made our own call out. So these are by no means universal. So this, this kind of lingo and whatnot is more unique to my situation, but we kind of had four distinct archetypes, if you will. So you can you have your slayers. Those are very obvious. I liken those to a DPS in a, in like a wow scenario or MOBA game, you have your DPS, you have your slayers. They're the guys that are going to go secure the kills and get the job done to the highest degree while maintaining their lives. Then you have control players. Control players are the guys that are are moving to points of domination and securing them, allowing the Slayers to transition throughout the map to get to their kills. A great example of this is the B capture point on Endless Veil. That is a crucial point of domination. So uh, having a good control player who prioritizes playing their life but territory control um, secure that area and locking it down gives you five what we call in the army avenues of approach to attack the enemy. You can swing back through your spawn. You can go all the way wide right through their spawn. You can cut two through the middle uh, on either left or right cubby, or you can go right up the middle and go down to toilet and start pushing left or right from there. So already having a control player like that can really open it up. Um, you have to have a shot caller. That's the third one. And that's a tough one because that person has to be engaged in their own gameplay, but at the same time, be able to look at what's going on in the macro game and make the calls. It might be right. It might be wrong. But at the best advice I've ever heard given by any of my coaches was better to be wrong together as a team and do it together than try to be right Mm -hmm. individually because there's Mm -hmm. greater degree for error to occur when you're performing individually, even if it's the right thing to do than if you're performing the wrong decision, but together. Um, And then the last one really is kind of just what you call the swing player. It's somebody that can rotate between any of those. Those are great to have. 
Um, typically, it means that that individual is slightly less skilled at one role or the other. Um, but I have several folks in our clan that can literally fill every role well. But like any competitive setting, it helps to have those that specialize in those three distinct roles uh, to really maximize that performance, if that makes sense. Okay, so uh, we've identified the shot caller as a, a special responsibility that that somebody's going to take on. Mm-hmm. Looking though at you know a control player versus a slayer, do you see those as kind of like an axis? So you have like a very static, very kind of rooted, positionally dominant player on one side, and someone who's rolling around the map slaying on the other side, and then you you sort of have everything in between, and you know players move from side to side. Um, and sort of swing player sits in the middle. I mean, would you say that's a way to characterize it or am I oversimplifying? I think there's a bit of an oversimplification there. I think what we all need to understand for our own individual, like wherever you peg yourself as your skill level, you have to understand that there's a continuum, right? There's this spectrum of skill, both for you individually and for everybody else in the game as a whole. So for instance, Bones. Bones is kind of downplaying his ability now and being a little bit humble. He's a very good player. <laughs> Let me put... And let me put this plug out there real quick. To be a 1.6 in survival countdown in the comp playlist on PC is hard. It is very hard because PC is very sweaty. The player base is not large. And the only people that are really committed to playing are very strong players or above average players. You don't really see a lot of learning folks on PC. So he's downplaying himself a little bit. He's a very good player. But I'll use him (laughs) as an example. He is a aggressive control player. And what I mean by that is he is at points of domination, whether he knows that he is or not, he's at them and he's engaging in the fight. He's not sitting back, just holding that zone. He's trying to find an angle. He's trying to constantly push up to that next point while not losing what he's holding. And those people are great because they are what I like to call rolling thunder, if you will. That's what we call artillery in the army. It's one of its nicknames is rolling thunder. They're constantly moving the, around the map at a slower rate of speed, but at a more controlled pace. So you can count on those people to be there for the fight while still holding, for instance, on Javelin. You know, the jump up right next to Heavy Box, uh, right off, off of the silo, that's a great example. You know, I remember playing Bones one time using his infamous Polaris Lance. He was, <laughs> he was on the Heavy Box, and his team was pushing up into B spawn, Um, and he was fighting from the outside heavy box and he was just slowly moving forward to and from cover, got on to jump up and made it impossible for me to pick up the heavy. He delayed us so bad that his team was finally able to flank around, even though it was a bunch of randoms, flank around and wipe us. And so what that forced us to do was we had to isolate bones, eliminate him, and then that opened up his team to being slayed. So a good, a good aggressive control player is always moving up and, and fighting, preparing to fight for that next fight. A passive control player is hanging back, just trying to hold what they have um, and letting someone else kind of do that for them, if that makes sense. Sure. Are there different skills that are emphasized between a control player versus a slayer? There are. Um, I would say that it, I don't want to pigeonhole anybody because sure. I've seen people be a great control player with a shotgun. I've seen people be phenomenal control players with a sniper. So I think there is a, some, obviously some variance there. But a lot of it's map dependent. A lot of it's team comp dependent. For instance, on um, a good example is burnout. Burnout, it's really hard to snipe on. But if you have someone that's really, really skilled, because that box is basically a Sudoku puzzle. It's nine smaller cubes hmm. inside one large cube. If you have somebody that's a great sniper, just thinking about it you know mathematically that's five of the nine cubes if you're in the right spot that you can lock down that's very powerful Uh, by the same token you can give a shotgun to somebody and they can make someone trying to push in that cube impossible Um, it it just depends on that person so i think Hmm. you i think you emphasize i think you emphasize somebody that knows when and where to to control and that's that's a hard thing to define um Sure. But, it, but it's, a, it's a mindset piece. It's not so much a skill piece or a weapon piece. It's a mindset piece that defines the control player. 
Damn, like Bird said, just listen to 182 all over again. There's so much to to take in the third and fourth time you hear it. Uh, this next clip is an old favorite. This is from a, a very fun moment in the Destiny competitive world where suddenly after tourney after tourney after tourney, this one strategy popped up, if you will, and Brood on episode 77 explained to us the bubble meta. When you've been in a certain competitive scene long enough, you hear people's names and they can be intimidating. You know, there's mm-hmm. the God Squads, there's I Am, there's BSK, there's these legendary players. And I think for a player trying to get into the scene when they're going up, they might psych themselves up a little bit. But once you get that first kill or you make like a good play, you're like, wait a minute. It's kind of like the same ritual of we we all put our pants on in the morning the same way. Like you got to look at it as like, <laughs> I put my pants on in a way you would not expect. <laughs> yeah. I do a, a double back. I don't even wear yeah. pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. but I, I kind of want to circle back to uh, you talking a little bit more about bub- the bubbles, the bubble strat, because yes. you kind of shook up the, uh, the tournament this week. Everyone was, Everyone was freaking out in the middle of the tournament that you guys were using it effectively. And uh, there's even been talk afterwards of banning them already. But th- <laughs> but that's just like the need jerk reaction that everyone has when they like get absolutely owned by something they don't expect. Yeah. So uh, tell me tell me a little bit about how you came to wanting to use it. Um, well, my teammate, my teammate Black, we play Trials every weekend, all weekend, and he means a defender, but obviously you have the advantage of the exotic gauntlets, which give you that overshield on a shotgun kill. You don't get those in sweats. <laughs> so we tried a couple different compositions, but nothing was really clicking. And we told him, you know, we're this is during practice. Like, let, let's give it a go. Let's try and make it. I've seen people use b- bubbles before, um, but not in a four-man. And the way an RPG game works is, you know, you have your DPS classes, you have your support classes. That's kind of how we wanted it to work. We didn't want everybody on our team to have the exact same role. And in a lot of the previous tournaments, you have your Goldie, you have your Storm, you have these supers where you're just roaming and gunning. We wanted to try and shake it up and slow it down a little bit um, for two reasons. We felt like we could control the pace of the game a lot better. And number two, we can mentally break a team. And we knew this uh, throughout practice. Uh, A lot of the teams that went up against us said they didn't want to practice us the next day because (laughs) it was just too frustrating. And I think it's kind of counterintuitive to not frustrate your opponent. I think that is a huge advantage for your team to keep your opponents mentally checked, whether they're complaining about your play style um, complaining about the super you're using. I think it's pretty typical of the Destiny community to call something a crutch. Um, <laughs> but if we can find and exploit those crutches, I mean, that's that's part of the game. Play to win. Play to win. And if you're going to be a little mad at how I played, but I won the game, I'll take it. <laughs> See, I, the thing I like about that, too, is that especially if there's no sort of input from Bungie to sort of shake things up, you know, new expansion or even a new balance patch, we, you know, just I think it's a human nature. You sort of get comfortable in whatever the meta is. And sometimes it seems just obvious, like, you know, with this balance patch, this is the way to play it. This is the best way to do it. I love to see something that just completely turns that on its head and you kind of realize, like, that might not have been the meta. That's just what we all thought was the meta. And it turns out there's unexplored avenues um, that could really change things up. Granted, you don't have long before everyone else has tried it and, you know, added it into the bigger picture. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a cool thing and definitely something that clearly a, a lot of people were not expecting to go up against. Yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned the meta and you watched the PlayStation tournament a few weeks before. And the bubble really wasn't there. Um, I think one or two teams had it. And then you fast forward to the Xbox tournament and the team that won the tournament was using bubble. Uh, The team that came in third had a bubble. So all of a sudden, these teams that are placing top, maybe they they figured something out, which is a quick turnaround from one month's time. (laughs) So is there a a counter to it, do you think? Or has that yet to be discovered? Or do you not want to reveal the counter to your... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the, the strategy no i'm i'm all for revealing the secrets especially because 
um, like Swain was saying, people were calling to ban it right after the tournament. Like this shouldn't, yeah, this yeah. shouldn't be in it. And I, so I am silly. <laughs> I implore those people to try and play with a bubble on their team. It's, it's not easy. And when you play with it, you, you understand it. Um, the number one way to obliterate a bubble is the shatter Nova bomb that kills the, the players inside and outside of it. So if you have a Nova specifically waiting to counter that, I mean, it's, it's going to be a tough. The chess match keeps going. Exactly. It's the chess match of what can I use to break the setup? A lot of people would think that, okay, a Titan smash is good. Um, but we knew how to play around it. If the smash goes in the bubble, we all hop out of it, kill the player. If it's outside, we stay in the bubble. So while it seems like a good idea, it really, it really came down to a good Nova bomb player. Um, the next part is there's, there's two phases of the defender bubble. One is when they pop it, are they running armor or blessing? Also, they're getting two orbs on that pop. So our mindset was if we survive the neutral game and the first cycle of supers, and then we pop our bubble, we're getting our second and maybe third cycles of supers faster than the other team. Okay, so look, we are into we are into master. This is the one percent tier. This stuff is fun. I enjoy this stuff. Um, it blows my mind to when we got to talk to people who who operate on this level. Um, odds are, if you're trying to get good, you should go back and listen to all those episodes we just <laughs> quoted. But eventually, you get to a point where you can really start focusing on those tiniest little tweaks to give you an edge. And um, I think a big adjustment for us was when D2 came out on PC and we were all learning mouse and keyboard. Maybe some of you guys knew mouse and keyboard. I did not know mouse and keyboard. <laughs> I still don't know mouse and keyboard. Um, but with that comes a whole new world of gear. And it's like, yeah, you can buy a fancy controller or a gaming monitor. If you don't have the basics in play, that's not going to make a difference. But when you really get to that level, these things become important. And this is just a very useful episode. If you're if you're getting into that PC mouse and keyboard gaming, this is episode 102 with our good buddy, Dr. Lupo. So that I, for me, if you want my exact keybinds, uh, on the left side of the mouse, um, the close of the two buttons is melee. The further one is nade. Um, in D2 on PC, you will have, you have a super specific bind, uh, which for me was the F key. Um, I use R for reload E for targeting a player like, uh, tag, uh, tagging one. So you can like inspect and stuff. Cause they still have that. It's, it's like clicking the right stick in on your, your PS4 controller, your Xbox, uh, one controller. Um, Q is class ability. Uh, C was crouch. One is change weapons. Um, and actually if, I don't remember if they, I think they did one, two and three for weapon one, yeah. weapon two, weapon three. Mm-hmm. So you'll do one, two and three as well. Tab was my ghost. Uh, space bar was jump and shift was sprint. And then obviously left click is shoe, right click is ADS. Lupo, um, I feel dumb right now because I did buy Overwatch for PC. Um, it doesn't have a heavy requirement, so my current PC can handle it just fine. I play yep. on Ultra. Did buy a gaming mouse, a new one. I've had gaming mice, but I bought a new one a couple months ago, and I have not clicked one of those buttons in the entire two weeks I've been playing PC <laughs> Overwatch. <laughs> and I'm literally looking at it like, oh, yeah. You <laughs> need to those use those, dude. That That's taking... <laughs> Is so people that have like dexterity issues with their left hand, that is taking weight off your left hand. Suddenly you have like when I, I, I rebind both, like when I play Overwatch, those two buttons on the side are that's my, those are my abilities for like every single character, unless there's a third ability. Like, like Soldier can sprint, that's shift. But otherwise, everything's on those mm-hmm. side buttons, dude, because there's, there's literally no reason to, mo- to, to have to make my, my pointer, my ring, and my middle finger on my left hand go anywhere other than WASD. It's like a, the same purpose of a scuff, really, I guess. To, it is. Your, to keep your fingers on the movement. Yep. I always accidentally hit the like the speed for my mouse. Ah, you've got buttons. one of those mice. You, yours is MLG. MLG Swain <laughs> brand. I don't know what I bought. 
but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and to be clear, you're not talking about those MOBA mice like the Razer Naga with no, like no, no. a That's, full numpad on the side, right? Hell no. You want <laughs> Okay. I have I have a Razer Death Adder Elite. It's got two buttons on the left side. It's got DPI up and down below the uh scroll wheel. Um and it's got a scroll wheel and left and right click and that's it. That's all you need. Um right. you people that are I mean it, the mouse is going to be preference. My preference is simplicity with with maximum functionality. Now, I've recommended this a billion times in stream. It was actually in a YouTube video that I made in a prep for Destiny 2 video. Uh, but if you're looking for a mouse and you you are like, I don't really like Razer. Oh, I'll tell you, I like my Death Adder 3500. I like my Death Adder Elite. But the Logitech G502 and I think the G602, although that's wireless, oh, which is terrible. Don't ever. Don't. I got the 402. That, I got the 502. That's probably the same sensor. But the 502 has one of the best rated sensors in the world right now. Um, and it's been a go-to. The 502 has been a go-to for gaming for a long, long time. It is still a good mouse to pick up. Now, it's not It's not like the end-all, be-all. You have to have this mouse. There's going to be a lot of people that are like, hey, Corsair makes good stuff too. You're right. Corsair does make good stuff. And they have really good sensors as well. But this is largely, I'm just saying, I know the 502 has a good sensor. So if you're looking for a guarantee, that's what I would say. And there's a couple different styles of mice too. Um, if you, and you guys are going to lift your, uh, all three of you and anybody listening, I hope you lift your mouse up and do this right now. Uh, if you lift it up and look at the bottom, the position of the laser for some is in the middle and for others is closer to where the wire connects at the top. Um, for me, I prefer the center because I feel like I can be more precise with it. The closer it is to the end of the mouse, the smaller, the movements you'll find you have to do to get precision because, Typically, you pivot you pivot from your elbow or your mm-hmm. shoulder, even sometimes, and so like little tiny movements will be more dramatic the further away the sensor is from your wrist. So we still haven't heard from one more guest that we needed to get on this episode, and. Uh, Here's the thing. I have no memory of ever talking to them. I've met them in person. I've played Destiny against them. We competed in a 1v1 tournament in front of 100 people. I, I just don't remember them being on the show, and I don't think I was there. I, so I have listened to all of them. Um, <laughs> are they, okay, this, this, this next guest uh, is Cammy. And we've talked to Cammy like three times, I think. You were definitely there for a full <sighs> Cammy episode. I, I, I know. Hmm. I, you weren't there for this one. But you were definitely there for a Cami episode. Huh. All right. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Look, at some point I started knowing who he was and following him on YouTube and watching his gameplay and thinking I need to do that. And I have no idea uh, when I learned about him or met him. So I guess I must have been there. And it just sort of like I just absorbed his knowledge through osmosis, which is the ideal way to acquire knowledge. Yeah. Well, I mean, let me tell you what, like you wish because the reality is, is that Cammy is just a different type of human being. Mm-hmm. The way he can process and explore and think about and design this game is just something that most people can't do. But we can still benefit from it. You know, we're all playing checkers. Some people are playing chess. Cammy is playing 3D chess, which was the name of this episode 176. But I want to repeat something that I I uh, I said earlier on in this episode. Which okay. Me, After that, I'm gonna wake up Swain. Okay, okay. Give him a give him a kick, but not yet. Destiny is a unique first person shooter. It's got roots in Halo. It's got roots in every other shooter game. I mean, there's there's Call of Duty things that show up in here. And it's a unique setting to be sure. It's a unique story. But there's this fundamental thing where it's it's really just a hodgepodge of all these different genres, all these different ideas, all coming together and working in one cohesive sandbox. And to me, there is there is very few players who really have what it takes to really explore and learn every inch of this sandbox. A friend of the show, Special K Dude, comes to mind. He he loves to do the deep dives. But there is, I don't think anyone else alive, even, I don't know, even inside Bungie, I would be surprised if there was someone who knew and knew how to use so completely and so thoroughly everything this game has to offer interchangeably. Um, to me, Cammy is the ultimate destiny player. He might not win every single tournament. He might not have the most subs, but in terms of embracing and appreciating everything that this game has put out into the world and making good on it, 
there's 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 no one else. Enjoy this clip from 176, uh, our chat with Cami Cakes. So, um, you, you know, you, you've talked about a couple of these already, but I think like on the psychological front, you know, this is a quote unquote shotgun meta, right? There's a lot of shotguns out there and a lot of people going from alive to dead quite quickly. Um, I feel like considering where it's been in the past, like the calls to nerf shotguns have been a little bit quieter this go around because it's just, it's not as much fun. We got our full choke nerf, all freaked out a little bit. Yeah. Um, but, you know, s- sort of knowing that you're going to be going up at least a couple shotguns, if not exclusively shotguns in the Crucible right now, uh, what are people doing wrong? How, how should we be avoiding death by shotgun? You would think shotguns are aggressive, right? And most of the time they are, but it requires real patience to beat them and you cannot play their game. And you're going to ask what their game is. Their game is to aggressively rush until it doesn't work. And then plan B for most shotgunners is, all right, I'm going to hover this doorway. And they will do that for one, maybe even two minutes. Not even joking. Someone will just warlock blue for hunter jump that same doorway for two minutes waiting you to get impatient angry that they're using a shotgun and be like man screw this dude i'm gonna go slide it nope there's a good chance you're gonna <laughs> lose it because they can switch either side of the doorway and you're gonna rely on a fast reaction time or a fast recovery reaction on the opposite side it, odds are not in your favor so even if you get them dead to rights weak If you don't have a grenade to clean up or whatever, don't play their game. Don't run out of that doorway. You're going to have to find a new way. That's my advice for dealing with shotguns, at least. That's the simplest tip, but I think it makes a world of a difference. Because the more people who don't play that game, the more shotgunners I don't think will resort to that almost, uh, what's the word, artificially artificially extending the game strategy. Because it really doesn't accomplish anything if I don't go under the doorway. I mean, that's... Well and good here, but there's a guy right over there. I see him on the radar. I really want to go get him, and you're telling me I should not go through the doorway. I mean, what are my options at that point? What should I be thinking instead? I know, okay, he's there. Good. Okay, time for me to do what? Time for me to work with a teammate. Even if it's a random and quick play or whatever, you two don't have to be communicating. Just use them to to go through first. (laughs) <laughs> no, you're not going to bait him. You're gonna <laughs> go in with him. This is going to be this is going to be simultaneous. One of you is going to die. Worst case, well, maybe both of you. Worst case, if this guy's a shotgun god, but let's just say that we're all on even playing field. We're all even skill. Worst case, he kills one of you, but at least he's going to get punished. He has to deal with two simultaneous targets, which is a lot more difficult than just one. Hmm. That's simple. Is there any particular loadout? Like if you were to build a loadout that is specifically, let's say, you know, you're playing quick play and you are going up against a lobby of exclusively hold forward shoulder charge and shotgun Titans. What's your loadout? And you're not going to play that game. What's your loadout that you're going to use to counter that? I either bring a bigger shotgun. (laughs) (laughs) Deal. I can bring Fighting Lion to just a straight wall bang them anytime I see red on the radar, right? Because chances are they're going to run straight through that door so I can have a Lion primed and ready to go. Could be 100 uh, off their health easily, which is an easy cleanup for anything. I could use Telesto and start uh, pocketing the bolts at the edges of doorways. I could try to use my team to play for power. Go Tractor Cannon. (laughs) Colony works wonders too because it forces them in the air. Um, I can use Chaperone, right? Because that's a precision shotgun that shuts them down from way further than they're going to one bang you. Mm-hmm. Aaron Tool does a good job. I, I think there's plenty of counters to shotgun. I did a formal video on this, but at the end of the day, if you personally don't feel that there's a counter to a shotgun, you need to learn to do it better. <laughs> I think you could probably say say that for most things, right? We all got access to pretty much the, the same thing. The thing is, though, is once you start becoming a better shotgun, you can use that playbook in reverse to now counter them. And the and only way to understand that playbook is to become a decent shotgunner. So you're saying to destroy what I hate, I must first become them. All right, boys. Well, that is it. Uh, I, uh, 
I need to go take a little bit of a nap, so I'm going to remain quiet for the rest of this episode. How about? It's a conscious choice I'm making <laughs> to not talk anymore. Ah, oh, man. I am, I am so looking forward to fall in radio. <laughs> it's going to be like, it's all I can think about, really. It's the next, um, it's the next step. It makes sense. It's definitely weird to be thinking two podcasts down the line. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, who knows where we'll be in our lives. Maybe Avengers 18 is coming out, but, you know, we are not going to fall back on this pact. You know, we will get together no matter where we are. Yeah. And we'll do Fallen sure. Radio, and we'll talk about playing as Fallen exclusively, a thing I am 100% sure will happen in Destiny. Yeah. We'll meet somewhere in the Bahamas. <laughs> yeah, like we'll be, be weird the, old the, <laughs> middle-aged men drinking margaritas. <laughs> that's the pack. Um on the PlayStation 5. Yep. Yeah, we'll be middle-aged men and it'll still be the PlayStation 5. This timeline is really checking out. <laughs> hey, Sony, Sony has one <laughs> reputation. That's for sure. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode, everyone. And we hope that these past two episodes serve as a useful guide. Uh, we really encourage you know, everyone to go back and listen to the episodes we pulled from for the last two weeks. Uh, I've, I'll post again a comment on the Reddit thread if you want the actual, uh, you know, episodes again, if you were in the car or something like that. Uh, I went and back and listened to episode 103 where we go through these ranks. It's so good. Like, I was so proud of us listening to that episode. It's, it's one of my favorites. And it has a really funny intro where a little kid just, like, makes fun of birds. <laughs> It tells him that he drinks his own farts and it's hilarious. Oh, we were so young, but that's it. Um, check out crucibleradio.com. Follow us on Twitter. Stay tuned for our next adventures on this feed. Cause we are, we are evolving, man. The, the fallen radio will happen in the future, but the next step is more immediate and it's real big. And we're excited for all of you to come along on the journey. So enjoy. I swear. I, I, I'm losing my mind with this with this thing. I like I honestly can't stop talking this fast. It's just like it's just gotta be processing faster. Like probably I should play some Destiny right now. I'll be making decisions a lot quicker. Just uh you, you know what I what I did was I started at the 1.5x. But uh but what I found is that if uh it, it actually adjusts the timestamps. And so to uh to be able to write the timestamps down without putting it out of that mode, it's nice to have a nice round number. So then I actually put it up to 2x, which felt too fast, but then I could just double whatever the current timestamp was to get the actual timestamp a little bit easier to do math. But then I realized, oh my god, I've got a lot to get. This is what you meant by making progress. This is what I got for being honest. Don't bother coming back. We've got music this week. Well, I I just went back through the archives. I wanted to pick something uh, for this Capstone episode that I thought really showed uh, someone who'd been there since the beginning still stuck around. And for me, there's there's just no one but but odd folks. I loved all the bands we've gotten to play and work with over the years. But um, I can't say I've, uh, I've played every single one of their albums. I've seen them live. I've hung out with them as I can about the boys and odd folks so uh yeah shout out to them check them out oddfolks.bandcamp.com What's up, everyone? Bones here. Do you like podcasts? Do you like chill conversation? Well, me and my co-host Swain and Birds put out a bonus podcast every month on Patreon. If you want to check it out and be a part of more awesome stuff, head over to patreon.com crucibleradio and join the squad. See you there.